Christianity is a religion of the word. Christians are a people of the book. These distinctives have defined the Christian faith from the beginning, even before the age of print that brought us books. As we enter what many are calling a post-literate age, pastors, professors, parents can help remind students and each other that the, the essence of the Christian faith centers on the word, capital W, and words, small w. From the carving of the Ten Commandments to the writing of the Torah to the copying and distribution of letters in the early church, God's plan was for his people to read. In a 1970 interview, the famous communications theorist Marshall McLuhan made an interesting observation regarding the connection between Christianity, literacy, and the surrounding culture. He said, I don't think it was accidental that Christianity began in the Greco-Roman culture. I don't think that Christ would have suffered under, under Genghis Khan with the same meaning as under Pontius Pilate. The Greeks had invented a medium, the phonetic alphabet, which, as Eric Havelock explains in his book Preface to Plato, made it possible for men to have for the first time in history a sense of private identity a sense of private substantial identity, a self, is to this day utterly unknown to tribal societies. Christianity was introduced into a matrix of culture in which the individual had enormous significance. This is not characteristic of other world cultures. So I think the way we read and what we read in this digital post-literate age changes, as it changes, so too might the character of the church change, as well as the relationship of the church to the surrounding culture. How will our reading habits affect the way we interact with the Bible? How will the way people read the Bible alter the church body? And how will a less literate church influence and be influenced by the culture in which we find ourselves? Earlier this year, several news outlets reported on so-called biblical literacy bills being proposed in at least six state legislatures, bills pushing for public high schools to require or encourage classes on the Bible's literacy and historical significance. While I'm undecided on the notion of requiring public schools to teach the Bible, I'm quite convinced that one cannot read much of the world's great books without getting a good dose of the good book. I think I'd rather the schools actually require much more reading of the small good books, small g good books, in fact. Because to fully appreciate Chaucer, Shakespeare, Dickens, Faulkner, Dante, Dostoevsky, Austin, the Brontes, or even The Handmaid's Tale, The Lottery, Fahrenheit 451, Lord of the Flies, The Grapes of Wrath, or Robinson Crusoe, any of those, and many, all, many more, readers need at least a passing familiarity with the Bible. To this point, a few years ago, a New York Times essay by Marilyn Robinson called The Book of Books, What Literature Owes the Bible, she wrote, a number of the great works of Western literature address themselves very directly to questions that arise within Christianity. They answer to the same impulse to put flesh on scripture and doctrine, to test them by means of dramatic imagination. This is one reason why I think the reading of good books and the, the reading of the good book is a mutually supportive behavior. While the highest levels of biblical and literary her hermeneutics can sometimes confound us, a basic and valid interpretive lens for reading the Bible can be as straightforward as the one for approaching a great literary work. Of course, as most college students here will probably um, tell us, and I, as an English professor, can confirm, the skillful reading of literature doesn't necessarily come naturally. It must be learned, and it can be taught. The inspired word of God, the Bible, is also a literary work written with artistry, a narrative arc, and themes, both major and minor. So just as there are valid and invalid approaches to reading, say, Huckleberry Finn, there are also right and wrong ways to read the Bible. As readers, whether the text we hold is God-breathed or merely mortal, we must take into account genre, purpose, audience, 
structure and point of view. And there's this guy named Leland Riken, who's written a lot about this. I highly recommend his work. We find meaning by understanding each passage within the context of the whole. Consider, for example, the problem of the reliability of the narrator. A certain level of readerly maturity, skill, and critical distance is required to discern between a reliable narrator and an unreliable one. So, for example, when Huck Finn tells us that his conscience is troubled for treating Miss Watson so mean by assisting her runaway slave, recognizing the unreliability of Huck as a narrator is imperative to grasping the meaning of the text as a whole. On the other hand, when the narrator of A Tale of Two Cities tells us it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, the skilled reader knows the narrative voice reflects the view of the implied author. Similarly, the skilled reader of the Bible can distinguish between description and prescription, between ceremonial law and moral law, and between the abol abolishment and the fulfillment of the law. Being a faithful reader of the text, any text, neither adding to it nor subtracting from it, reading parts in the context of the whole, letting text interpret text. These are all skills that require both learning and practice. And it's a skill we as a culture have been practicing throughout the world for over 500 years. Literacy has changed the world and changed the way we live. Yet long before the printing press and widespread literacy, God was cultivating a, cultivating a relationship with his chosen people focused on the written word. The words God carved into stone at Mount Sinai included, in fact, a caution against images, setting up a peculiar word-based relationship with his followers that contrasted starkly with the image-worshipping pagan nations surrounding the Israelites. This is an observation made famously by Neil Postman in Amusing Ourselves to Death. Before Sinai, in the Garden of Eden, the skins with which God covered Adam and Eve after they sinned were a type or a foreshadowing of the skin that would cover God himself in the incarnation and which would then cover the sin of all believers. As David Lyle Jeffrey explores in depth in his work, People of the Book, Christian Identity and Literary Culture, even the animal skins or the vellum on which early scriptures were later written also remind us of this skin covering. This motif continued throughout church history, according to Jeffrey. Medieval paintings frequently depict Mary, other biblical pictures, and the church fathers anachronistically holding the Bible. Uh, and there's a slide that I have that hopefully, there we go, okay. Um, God's word, um, both written and incarnate, beckons us, oops, sorry, I skipped my, a pair, this one. Um, this, this scene, is one from a manuscript numbered 69 in the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is a mid 15th century illuminated manuscript created by an unknown artist and uh, art historians and art critics actually say that the artist is not very skilled. I'm, I guess I'm not a good judge of that. Uh, but this is a good example of many other variations of Mary being depicted as a reader. And not just a reader, but she's actually holding a book these scenes are often in the context of the Annunciation, uh, and, and they symbolize Mary's reception of the Word, the, the child and the book in her hands. Uh, it's an image of the Word becoming incarnate. Such images, even or especially when they're anachronistic, because bound books didn't exist when Mary bore Christ, symbolize the centrality of reading to Christian faithfulness and point out the concrete, tangible nature of the word. In many of these paintings, the subject is depicted, as with this one, it's a little hard to see, but with a finger inserted into the book's pages, suggesting active reading and reflecting even how later Thomas needed to put his fingers into Christ's body in order to know and believe. God's word, both written and incarnate, beckons all of us to come close and engage in a tactile relationship. 
As we read in John 1:14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And some human beings even got to touch him. One of us held him in her womb, as the old Orthodox hymn sings to Mary, he whom the entire universe could not contain was contained within your womb. Despite the centrality of the word and words from the beginning of God's revelation, many generations of believers were, of course, unable to read the Bible for themselves, if they even had one. Before the Reformation, biblical words passed through priests and were supplemented by images depicted in stained glass windows and in itinerant drama troops performing biblical stories. These symbols offered rich beauty, but images alone cannot convey the abstractions of doctrine. Thus, in the preliterate age preceding the Reformation, the Bible was delivered and understood only in pieces, not the whole body. The Reformation's focus on reading and the resulting age of literacy at birth were, in some ways, the culmination of the logo logocentrism or the word-centeredness that runs through the Bible and God's relationship with creation. Again, from the book of John, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. These words are, of course, a direct echo of Genesis 1, where we read that God created uh, the world with his words. And while the word of the Lord, that phrase, refers to all the ways God reveals himself, whether spoken, as in Genesis 1, or in a vision, as in Genesis 15, or as written words throughout the Bible, God's word is always logical, linear, and coherent. Likewise, the key feature of a literate age is the cultivation not only of the ability to read, but of the propensity to think in a logical, linear, coherent fashion. Yet it is significant that the act of reading is not natural to the human brain. While scientists see reading in terms of evolution and adaptation, reading is in some ways supernatural, I think, or at least unnatural. In her book, Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World, neuroscientist Marianne Wolfe explains that reading is not hardwired in the human brain the way language is. Not only does the remarkable plasticity of the human brain make reading possible, but the activity of reading actually creates new circuits in our brain. These circuits aid us in learning abstract and creative concepts that go beyond the brain's genetically programmed functioning. Reading thus demands what she calls extraordinary cerebral complexity, and the brain requires years of deep reading processes in order for these circuits to be formed. Our reading habits, therefore, have the potential to shape our very brains for good or ill. Deep reading activates regions of the brain related to touch, motion, and feeling, and helps develop the background knowledge that we bring to further reading and living. The consistent strengthening of the connections among our, our Analogical, inferential, empath empathic, and background knowledge processes, Wolf says, generalizes well beyond reading. In other words, these brain processes that we gain through reading apply to real life. She says, when we learn to connect these processes over and over in our reading, it becomes easier to apply them to our own lives. I don't know if Wolf is a Christian, but her findings seem to confirm the truth of Psalm 119, 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Cognitive science further shows that our brains work one way when accustomed to reading in logical linear patterns and another way when continually bouncing from tweet to tweet, picture to picture, and screen to screen. Uh, I don't know if um, Dr. Gibson is here, but I feel like he would have a lot to say about these things <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about. Um, Wolf's research shows that reading on digital devices does not create the same kind of brain circuits as deep reading. In the shallows, what the internet is doing to our brains, Nicholas Carr cautions that calm, focused, undistracted, the linear mind is being pushed away 
by a new kind of mind that wants and needs to take in and dole out information in short, disjointed, often overlapping bursts. The faster, the better. I think we all, if we spend any time on our devices, we experience that. So as our reading becomes more immersed in a digital rather than a print culture, the more we return to some qualities of the pre-literate world. We are reading more, but the way we read replicates the effects of the discrete images of stained glass windows more than the sustained logical and coherent linearity of a whole book. Story, narrative, my specialty, I argue, um, cultivates in us the practices that can lead away or toward the good life or the virtuous life. Virtues, according to Aristotle, are the moderation between the vices of excess and deficiency. They manifest within us, but, um, within the context of a given situation, as a practiced response to whatever great good uh, or great ill a life, a day, or a moment, or an hour might bring. The good life, or the virtuous one, as philosophers call it, does not depend upon the absence of suffering, pain, ill, or wrong, but is the constant practice of making up for loss, not with excess, but with the grateful mean that restores balance and harmony. Uh, it's exactly what we read about in the scripture today, and also as we read in the King James Version of uh, Philippians 4, 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. Virtue is acquired through both knowledge and practice. Practices are the patterns we put ourselves through every day, every year, through a lifetime. As James K. A. Smith has shown in his book, Desiring the Kingdom, and then later Imagining the Kingdom, practices become habits, habits become virtues, and ultimately virtues become who we are and what we love. In Imagining the Kingdom, Smith explains that imagination is fundamentally aesthetic in nature, tangible, it, something we sense and feel. As human beings' meaning-making faculty, imagination is the force that presses us, making impressions on us and in us. Being made in the image of God, the process of imaging or imagining is a simultaneous and reciprocal receiving and sending forth. So imagination is both mimetic and generative. It both imitates and creates. Without imagination, we are mere animals, worms living our days in the dark. But good books tap into the powers of imagination, allowing us to picture the possibilities, both bright and dark, for human existence, possibilities we might not otherwise know. Literature, makes concrete, it embodies and incarnates the abstractions of ideas and ideals. The world's literary masterpieces provide a formative classroom. In holding forth visions of the good life, great literature cultivates the desire for that good. Reading such literature is a practice that cultivates virtue as the reader inhabits the world of, book, of the book and exercises vicariously the choices and actions embedded in that world. As C.S. Lewis famously observed, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. In other words, we cannot desire what we cannot imagine, and we cannot imagine what we have not seen. This is why Jamie Smith again explains that imagination precedes desire because actions are pulled out of us according to our vision of the good life and what it means to be human. But the human imagination is more than just a picture-making function. Language is inextricably bound to the working of the imagination. Imagination is, after all, the expression of our creator showing forth his image in his creation. To imagine is to, is to mirror God through imagination, a mere picture becomes an idea expressed in words, which then becomes a way of being and acting in the world. 
Reading virtuously means first reading closely, being faithful to both text and context, interpreting accurately and sightfully. Indeed, there is something in the very form of reading, the shape of the action itself, that tends toward virtue. The attentiveness necessary for deep reading, the kind of reading we hopefully practice in reading not just literature but the Bible, requires patience. The skills of interpretation and evaluation require prudence. Even the simple decision, which is harder and harder for most of us, to set aside time each day to read in a world rife with so many other choices competing for our time requires a kind of temperance. To read well is to not merely scour the pages for lessons on what to think, rather to read well is to be formed in how to think. And again, to cite C.S. Lewis, apt where we are today. In in Experiment and Criticism, he explains that to approach a literary work with nothing but a desire for self-improvement is to use it rather than to receive it. While great books do offer important truths about life and character, Lewis cautions against using them merely for lessons. Literary works are, after all, he says, works of art to be enjoyed for their own sake rather than merely used for our own. To use art or literature rather than to receive it, he says, merely facilitates, brightens, relieves, or palliates our life, but does not add to it. Reading well adds to our life, not in the way a tool purchased from the hardware store adds to our life, for a tool does us no good once lost or broken, but in the way a friendship adds to our life, altering us on the inside forever. In a word-centered faith, the ability to read well is central. As a people of the book, Christians have a particular calling to preserve and promote the gift of deep reading and the word. The power of reading words and the word well is the power to alter us and the world forever and ever. Amen.